to be the one My light and my salvation With the wicked, my enemies and my foes Came upon me to eat up my curse They stumbled and fell Let's celebrate Jesus
my mind, break through in my spirit, break through in my soul, break through in my week, break through in my struggle. You are the God, you are the God of the breakthrough in my worship, break through in my praise, break through when I live, glory by your name, break through when I dance, break through when I shout. You are the God, you are the God of the break through in my heart. you. We are delighted that you are with us here this morning, coming to you from the sanctuary of Cornerstone Pentecostal Church in Liberty Lake, Washington. We want to start with prayer this morning. There quite possibly are those of you that are visiting with us here this morning, and we are delighted that you have decided uh, to join us here this morning. We want to pray for our president and our country. We want to pray for our community. We want to pray for Cornerstone Pentecostal Church members in particular. And also, if you have any special requests right now or unspoken requests, this is a perfect time to make those known unto the Lord. Let's pray together right now. Father, by the authority of the name of Jesus, we love you, we praise you, we worship you. We thank you for the opportunity to be filled with the Holy Ghost in the 21st century. God, I believe in you for great and wonderful and mighty things. Father, I pray for our president and those that are in leadership of our nation, that you would lead them and guide them in this time. I pray for our local community here, that you would continue to engender a hunger and a thirst uh, for the things of God and after righteousness. And Father, I pray for Cornerstone Pentecostal Church that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out your blessing and your presence in every home, in every life. Father, I pray that you would open up doors of opportunity for us to communicate the hope that lieth within us in this hour. Father, any special unspoken requests or defined requests that are going up now, God, I pray that they find an answer in you for your ever-present help in time of need. We ask it 
in the name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. Praise God. I would like to draw your attention uh, today to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter number one. 1 Timothy, chapter number one. And we are going to begin reading in verse number 18. 1 Timothy 1 and 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. I want to read that again because it is so latent with power and so latent with direction. Verse 18, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them, the them being the prophecies, the promises that were placed on his life, mightest war a good warfare. I want to talk to us for a few moments this morning about fighting for your future. Fighting for your future. Let's pray. Let's pray that God would anoint this in a special measure to go beyond the cameras, go beyond this sanctuary, go beyond uh, this three acres here in Liberty Lake. And it would, it would resonate in every life. And God would speak to you about your present and your future. Let's pray again. Father, by the authority of the name of Jesus, we pray for this message today, that it would resonate so deeply in every life, that it would give direction and give instruction that we can obtain the promises and the prophecies that are placed into our lives. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, and everybody said, amen. This is an incredible scripture because you are reading a, um, a letter that is being written to Timothy that is now the pastor at the church uh, at Ephesus. And it is being written by his father in the Lord, the Apostle Paul. And at the very outset of this letter, the Apostle Paul is giving Timothy, a young pastor, specific and very direct instructions. In fact, it is called a charge. It is not up for argument. It is not up for the opinions of others. It is very direct when he says, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy. That brings illumination to this very special relationship that existed between the Apostle Paul and Timothy. Um, and it's unique in many ways because Timothy came from a blended household. In fact, he is the very first uh, preacher that we find in ministry in uh, the book of Acts and beyond that comes from a mixed household. It was not purely uh, Jewish and it was not purely an apostolic household. Uh, you may know and recall that his mother is Jewish and his father is a Gentile. That probably would not raise a lot of eyebrows here in the 21st century. However, in uh, the first century and at the time that this was written, it was greatly frowned upon to have a mixed marriage and then a mixed household. And so Timothy is coming into the ministry with a certain background. And he uh, has an incredible spiritual awakening. And the Apostle Paul becomes a part of his life and a part of that uh, explosive spiritual awakening so that Paul himself could write and say, uh, unto the son Timothy, according to 
the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Of course, a prophecy is a supernatural utterance. And this particular utterance came through his spiritual father, the Apostle Paul, into his life. And he is instructing Timothy that you are to war a good warfare, not just a casual consecration, not just a haphazard dedication, but you are to war a good warfare according to these prophecies. Hallelujah. We're going to talk about some things here this morning that are going to help us to understand that once you have been given a promise from God, and once you have been given a prophecy from God, that it is to have a very special place in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, in our prayers, in our spiritual warfare. Praise God. And so, uh, Timothy, the young pastor in Ephesus, has uh, a particular background. Interestingly to us here this morning is that in the second letter that the Apostle Paul writes to him in chapter 1 and verse 7, uh, it's as if Timothy is bringing some, uh, perhaps some inexperience or perhaps in some areas of his life that have not yet uh, completely been brought under the dominion of the Holy Ghost when the Apostle Paul writes unto him and says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. That word fear there literally means intimidation. Intimidation. That Timothy is to take the oversight at the church at Ephesus, and he is to do so in the Holy Ghost. And God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power and love and a sound mind. Praise God. The Apostle Paul addresses Timothy in three different um, sequences in his life. The very first thing that he addresses in his life is the past. In 2 Timothy uh, chapter number one, begin reading verse number five, the apostle Paul writing to Timothy says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. The apostle Paul is, is drawing Timothy back to remember and to appreciate that you did not get here on your own. You are here, you are connected to uh, several generations of prayers, several generations of consecration, and not just your mother, but also your grandmother. When you look at the past, which I should also like to take note, in verse number seven, as a result of his past, this is why, and this is the context, that Paul says, for God has not given unto us the spirit of fear. You have momentum, Timothy. You have a background, Timothy. You have prayers generationally that are behind you. The Apostle Paul is bringing him back to the place of appreciating the fact that you are not isolated in the ministry. You are not standing alone in your ministry, but there is a past that is behind you and it is from the prayers and the unfeigned faith that is in thy grandmother Lois and also in your mother Eunice. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance. You are to look back at the past with great appreciation and great recognition that you are in a lineage of faith and a lineage of prayerfulness and a lineage of godliness. And that is why we should go back and gain strength from your past. Interestingly here in verse 
Um, number six, the apostle Paul says, wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. We're, we've just talked about the past and the apostle Paul is telling him and reminding him, not just the generations of unfeigned faith, but also the giftedness by being under the hands of his pastor and being under the hands of his spiritual father. In every one of these sequences of time in which we are going to look at here for the next several moments, in every one of these, there is the involvement and the interaction of his pastor. I want to stop long enough to, not, to say this because we're living in a day and an age where our world wants to minimize the placement of godly authority and minimize the importance of apostolic succession through God-called ministry. Timothy would not be where he is today only on the prayers of his grandmother and the unfeigned faith of his mother. But it had to take also the immediate submission to godly authority in which he receives his giftedness in verse number six. But I want you to take note with this looking back to appreciate and looking back to memorialize and looking back to have a great understanding that I am in a generational flow here. There is no mention of warfare. That is not where the battle is. I've met several people through uh, almost 30 years of ministry. And uh, every once in a while you find somebody that is still b battling something in the past. They're still fighting with something uh, in the pages of their past life, in the chapters of their past life. I want you to understand that the Apostle Paul is recognizing that we should appreciate our past. If nothing else, thank God for the grace of God. Thank God for the power of God. Thank God for the word of God that has brought us to where we are today. Let's clap our hands and thank God for that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The past is for appreciation and it is not for warfare. And then the apostle directs his son in the Lord to the present, which is found in 1 Timothy chapter number four and verse number 12 where the apostle says, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy. Notice, whether it's the past, the present, or the future, every one of these involved the contact of the laying on of hands with the ministry. And he's saying, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the, of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy prophecy may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. Here we are now dealing with the present. We're dealing with his consecration. We're dealing with his dedication. We're dealing with his daily spiritual life. We've already dealt with the past. That's a great appreciation to know that generations of unfeigned faith are behind me and I have no reason to fear. But now I'm talking about the present. I am not just carelessly living my day. I'm not just carelessly spending my time. I am giving myself to the attendance of reading. I'm giving myself to doctrine. I'm recalling and, and appreciating the gift that was put into my life. But once again, recognize that even though there is a rehearsing of his present consecration and dedication, that there is no mention of warfare. There is no mention of fighting. There is no mention of, of scrapping and struggle. These are things that should already be into place. 
I want to stop long enough to tell us that are viewing this here today that if your struggle is just to consecrate, then your struggle needs to be settled. We have a much bigger war to pursue. We have much bigger things to go after. We do not need to be giving our energy to the past. We need to settle it. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just putting the blood on our path and overcoming the lies of the devil and overcoming him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, forever, forever sealing the past. Maybe in the future, we need to buckle down and say, you know what? I need to get back to prayer. I need to get back to fasting. I need to get back to the word of God. I need to get back to, to being a steward of the mysteries of God instead of struggling how I'm gonna spend my time and struggling what am I gonna do with my life and struggling how how I'm going to do my day. That is not where the battle is. Those things should be settled. It shouldn't be an argument or a war to go to revival. It shouldn't be an argument or a war to pay our tithes. It shouldn't be an argument or a war to pray every day. We should have those things settled so that we can get into the arena and fight the most important war of all. Let's clap our hands and thank God that these things can be forever settled and we can move forward into the things of God. God, I thank you and I praise you. I give you glory. I give you glory. I give you glory. So we've already talked about the past. My leadership was involved in that. My chronology was involved in that. I have great appreciation for that. And then I have my present, my consecration my dedication, and my pastor and, my, and the ministry is involved in my life in that. And now it's time to talk about the future. In our text here this morning, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before in thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. The war is not in some bitterness of yesterday. It's not in some jockeying for position and self-importance in the present. But all of my good warfare is to be focused on my future. It is to be harnessed. It is to be saddled. It is to be controlled. And it is like some arrow that is not just shot carelessly or taking some swing where we beateth the air, but it is intended to hit the mark. It is intended to bring about the promises and the prophecies of God for my future. I want to stop long enough to say that this is not limited to some prophecy that has to be uh, linked up with a man's ministry. And in this case, I believe it was. I do not want to extrapolate and I do not want to go into that any deeper. But I want to say that if God has ever given you a promise that your children are going to pray back through and be saved, I would stand on that. If God has ever given you a promise that, that your wife or your husband or neighbors or coworkers or whoever are going to be saved, I would not cast that to the, to the side. I would not allow myself to get distracted. I would fight for that promise. Whatever your promise is this morning, that involves your future, that is where the warfare should be. And somebody said, amen. I want to talk to us about three things that I believe are critical to bringing our future to pass and potentially could become enemies to the fulfillment of our future. Number one, I want to talk to us about the need for repetition. In other words, allowing yourself to forget what you were really fighting for. You forget that consecration, that dedication, that level of spiritual warfare that you had already predetermined within yourself that you were willing to do. This need for repetition is, is a dynamic in our world. This is why people need five notices from the bank to find out that there's no money in your account. This is why people need five signs that tell 
uh, the speed limit before you realize that there's flashing blue lights in my, in my mirror to remind me that I just need another reminder. God is not one to continue in repetition. The Bible says that in Jonah chapter number two, that the, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. We do find where God speaks twice. We do find where God speaks three times. But the unending reminder to keep us on track is something that I do not find in scripture. I remember many, many years ago as a new convert. Uh, in fact, I wrote it in one of my, my very first Bible that was given to me uh, by a dear friend of mine in the Rock Church in Sacramento, California. And I was praying by the side of my bed and I wrote inside that Bible what I felt like the Holy Ghost said to me. And when God gave me that word, it was like, it was like, it was like an atomic bomb of, of, of faith that was birthed in my spirit. And that is so important that when you get a word, a promise, a prophecy of direction in your life, that that word germinate, it becomes engrafted. It becomes farther, uh, deeper than the carnal mind, deeper uh, than, than the folly of the human heart, deeper than the foolishness and opinions of others. It's something that begins to guide your steps and order your steps. I, I can remember as a new convert that I was starting to mold and shape the way I thought and the way I walked according to what I felt like God told me. I, I remember not going out with certain people and not uh, staying back from certain activities. I'm not necessarily uh, sinful behavior, but just things that I didn't want to be a part of because I wanted to bring that word to pass. There might be somebody that I'm preaching to here this morning that you can recall years ago that God gave you a promise and God spoke something to you. I want to tell you that these words that God gives us are outside of time. They do not deal with chronology and times and seasons. If you can get back to that place, back to that Bethel, back to that certain place, allow that word of God to germinate. Allow that promise to become a reality, to begin to guide your direction and guide your steps. Let's clap our hands and give him praise. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Allowing carnality to steal a promise that was given in the spirit is one of the most common things that I have seen uh, even as a pastor. I remember many, many years ago, there was a family, uh, a sweet family, precious family uh, that came to this church that was in their 30s, uh, nearing 40s. Uh, they had several beautiful children. Uh, and for several years, they were a great blessing to the work of God here. Faithful people, godly people. And um, through the passage of time, I never will forget one night um, I was at home and I got a call from a new convert that had been over to their home having some fellowship. And he said, Pastor, did you uh, hear what this family is about to do? And I said, no, I had no idea. What, what, what are they talking about doing? He says, well, they're talking about going across town and starting a church. And they had never voiced that to me. They had never even indicated that to me. And so I, I thanked uh, this person for relaying this information. And the very next day, I called this family up, uh, husband and wife, and I said, you know, I'd like to talk to you guys. I'd like to sit down with you and have a meeting with you and talk to you. And so we met uh, later that week. And before they walked in, I got to the church early and I began to pray. And I said, God, I... I I want to understand what's going on here. And I felt like God gave me specific direction about where this family was. We, uh, we both sat down in a Sunday school room and I said, I feel like God showed me something about your lives. And I said, you were both 18, 19 years old, graduating from Bible college. And when, as graduating Bible college, you were faced with two doors. 
Door A was the door of ministry in which there would be humble and meager beginnings and perhaps bare cupboards and just barely getting by. But the joy and the thrill uh, and the exhilaration of being in the will of God and dedicating ourselves uh, to the unfolding will of God in our lives. And then there is door B. And door B represented starting a family and, and getting a career and, and buying a home and, and having two cars in the driveway and bills and obligations and responsibilities, so on and so forth. And I said, I felt like God had showed me that now many years after these two doors were offered to you, that you chose door B, but now you're trying to force open door A. And I felt like the Holy Ghost told me to tell them that door A no longer exists because it was time sensitive. However, God has a new door for you. When I got done saying this, the wife started to openly weep and she said, Pastor, I remember exactly when God gave us those two choices. I remember exactly when those two choices were talked about. I remember exactly when we made our choice. And I reiterated, God has a brand new door for where you are right now. Ladies and gentlemen, when we receive a promise and a prophecy from God, oftentimes these are given uh, in a certain equation of our lives, God's understanding where we are positionally in our lives. And they are built into the overall development of, of who we are as people. So that as I give myself to this promise and give myself to this prophecy, that I come out on the other end of this process of, of this word of God and living with this word so that now I'm, I'm available and ready for the fulfillment of this promise. And some of these are given and they are time sensitive because they are built in to the overall amortization of my life, which is why it's important that when you get a promise of God, it is not equal to a career. It is not equal to some, some happenstance, some human pursuit. When you get a genuine promise and prophecy from God, it is worth everything. It's worth, worth fighting for. It is worth your past, your present, and your future. Somebody clap your hands and give God the praise. Perhaps you're watching this here this morning and you already can go back through the hallway, the corridor of your memory. And you can remember that God gave you such a promise. You were in the right place at the right time and you received the right word. But it seems like all hell has broken loose. I want to tell you something. As a pastor, I have recognized that when you publicly state that God spoke to you and God has called you to do something in particular, I want you to know that what you have done is, is you have almost closed a circle of God giving the word and God, God promoting that word in you. And now you in agreement with that word. And now you have uttered that word publicly. I want you to know, and I've seen this happen several times, that all of hell will break loose to try to destroy your future when you have uttered what God wants you to do. I want to tell you that it is no time to get involved with something that, that is frivolous. It is no time to try to bury your head in the sand. It is time to get a spiritual warfare that says, bless God. If God says I'm going to do something for him, I'm going to do it. If God is calling me to do something, I'm going to do it. If God is going to use me to accomplish something in the earth. That is what I'm going to have in Jesus name. The need for repetition. Even Jacob recognized that there's some things that happen at Bethel that are unlike any other place in our life. And I want to encourage you to get back to Bethel. When Jacob got back to Bethel, there were supernatural things that happened again because it was a place where God visited and communicated with Jacob. Let's just lift our hands and pray right now. I'm just feeling like there's somebody that's connecting some dots out there 
And, and you may not even know who I am and I may not even know you, but that's not even important. The Holy Ghost is communicating with you right now that God is not done with you. What's happened is you've lived a life outside of the timeline of that promise and you think you've blown it. Now you're starting to condemn yourself for that. I wanna tell you, God has a new door for you. God has a new avenue for you. God has a new, uh, a new job for you to do, if you will. God has something for all of us that is future tense. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, whoever I'm preaching to, wherever they may be, I pray that you rake back the covering and you begin to reveal to them and foster within them that you are, you are not through with them. You are not done with them. And I want to tell the devil, devil, you may have had yesterday, but you cannot have tomorrow. It's going to be different now. It's going to be different, different, different in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. The need for repetition. We have a tendency to take our modeling and our conditioning in the flesh and try to transpose that in how God works. And God just doesn't work that way. You get a word from God. You vouchsafe it. You fight for it. And you protect it. The next thing I want to talk to us about is getting caught up in the wrong war. If you're gonna fight and you're gonna get caught up in any kind of conflict that could divert your attention, I wanna encourage you to reserve that for things that really matter. David, of course, very famous story of David, at the time the kings go forth to battle, which is springtime, the ground that was moist after the thawing out of winter is now hardened in which armament and military battalions can move without being encumbered with mud. But David stays back in Jerusalem while God's people are fighting. And while God's people are fighting, David loses the wrong war in the wrong place, at the wrong time. David tries to articulate and enact some executive privilege because it was known during the Bronze Age that despots and monarchs and evil kings, they had a reputation of being able to take any woman they wanted in their kingdoms, regardless of whether they were married or not. That made no difference which is one of the reasons why Abraham and Sarah may have had their agreement that while they were journeying, that they, Abraham, Abram feared for his life. And so all of these nations that surrounded Israel were all employing this executive privilege of having any woman in their kingdom until those spirits finally convinced David that maybe he could have the same privilege. You know the story. David loses the wrong war in the wrong place at the wrong time. It is critical that we are fighting the right battle in the right place at the right time. And brothers and sisters and ladies and gentlemen, that takes the Holy Ghost. It takes a daily consecration. If David had given himself to daily consecration, he would have never been on the rooftop that night. If David had been a man of daily consecration, he would have been in battle with God's people. If David had been a man of daily consecration, he would have never sent somebody to take uh, Bathsheba. You have to be fighting the right battle in the right place in the right time to make sure that your future is secure. And David's sin greatly impacted the rest of his earthly rule. I wonder how many people that are watching me here this morning are recognizing, you know what, the pastor's right right now. I've been giving myself to foolishness. Maybe somebody 
um, calls you up and said, you know what, somebody did me wrong over here and, and I don't like them, so I don't want you to like them and, and we're gonna create this big deal going on and, and, and uh, I want you to be their enemy like I'm their enemy. You know what, I, 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 I believe there's a right time and appropriate time for all those kind of things. But I wanna tell you something, I, I don't have time. I, my, my future is far too important to me to get caught up in somebody else's battle. You settle it. You, 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 you meet them face to face. You engender forgiveness. You get rid of the bitterness. You get rid of the resentment. I'm not going to carry out anybody's duties. I've got to fight for my future. That's the only thing that matters. Let's lift our hands and ask God to help us because there may be somebody under the sound of my voice that you've allowed yourself to get caught up in some secondary little deal where it's, we're wrestling flesh and blood instead of principalities and powers. Let's pray. Father, by the authority of the name of Jesus, forgive me for getting caught up with that which is menial and, and meaningless and the tedium of life instead of the grand panoramic scope that you have my life included in in the future. Help us, God. Help us, God. Help us, God, in Jesus' name. Lastly, the last point that I want to make, I want to talk about being distracted at the time of fulfillment. The nation of Israel, time would fail us here this morning. If we were to talk about the careful placing and the posturing, of men and prophecy and the crimson thread that was woven meticulously through the Old Testament and the prophecies that were given that were to bring men, a man and a wife out of the Ur of the Chaldees and that prophecy that is passed on and fulfilled in the book of Exodus and then the settling in the promised land in the book of uh uh, judges and so on and so forth and the meticulous bringing of messengers to preach to God's people and some of them prophesying about a coming redeemer some of them talking about the correction from idolatry some of them pre-exilic about the warnings of not not repenting and not getting rid of idol all of the volume of voices of prophecy and promise in the Old Testament that is bringing the nation of Israel to their greatest moment after 430 silent years. And Jesus, in Luke chapter number 19, makes a profound statement that resonates into this sanctuary this morning. And Jesus, describing the process of the nation of Israel, what would happen because of the blindness in their heart, says, and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. The nation of Israel was still stinging from being in the times of the Gentiles. They were still, we know this because even the disciples at the time of Jesus' ascension into heaven, they're still asking the preeminent questions of their culture. Are you gonna restore the kingdom to Israel? It was all here and now instead of there and then. It was all get us out underneath the crushing heel of the Roman Empire instead of understanding that the prophecies that are multiplistic throughout the Old Testament, talking about God robing himself in flesh and unto us a child is born. They did not recognize who Jesus was and they didn't understand what he was here to do it. They were completely distracted by present circumstances instead of understanding their futuristic placement in the program and the plan of the almighty God. I'm gonna tell you, there's some things worth fighting for. And there's some things you just need to let go. There's just some things, it just, did, the devil is, gonna, is going to try to, the closer you get to the fulfillment, the more he's going to try to distract you. 
the more he's going to try to abort. He can see your plan. He can see your program. Joseph is, is, given, is given an incredible prophecy, unlike anything before or anything after. One in which he had the physical a coat of many colors. He is, he, it's not only an invisible, but it's also a visible promise and a prophecy. It's a, the adoration and the favor that he had from his father with a multi-colored coat. But it's also the promise of, of obeisance, of the stars making obeisance uh, in this prophecy. And yet, even though he has this prophecy, even though it is, it is mind-boggling, the prophecy that is given to Joseph, he finds himself in a pit. He finds his brethren lying about uh, his, his demise. He, he is sold uh, in, into, into slavery. He, he is sold uh, on, the, on the auction block uh, to Potiphar's household. He is lied about immorality. Lies, 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 lies. Distraction, distraction, distraction. He's now in jail. Uh, the baker and the butler get out before he, he does. He's still sitting there. He's sitting there with a prophecy. He's sitting there with a promise, but he didn't get bitter. He didn't get ugly. He didn't get distracted. He didn't lose his, his original love for the things of God. And the time came where God exalts him into position. And he is the perfect illustration of a refusal to get distracted, either by lies, immorality, in prison, Lied about, good reason to get bitter, good reason to get hateful. Are you out there watching? Yes, you are. And you're listening to me right now. And you're recognizing, oh God, God, I don't want anything in my life. In fact, let's pray together right now. God, I don't want anything in my heart. I don't want anything in my mind. I don't want anything that could, I'm gonna stay focused on you. I'm gonna stay close to the man of God, the one that laid hands on me, the one that promised me, the one that gave prophecies. I, I'm gonna stay close. I'm gonna stay on track. I'm going to stay in the groove and not allow myself to get distracted at the time of fulfillment. Praise God. Let's just lift our hands and let's praise him and let's pray. Father, I love you. God, I praise you. There's somebody, there's more than just one. There's multiplied. There's many, many that are hearing this this morning that are saying, I, you know what? I've allowed present circumstances. We're under this coronavirus. Money's running out. We're, 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 we're going at each other's throats. The walls are caving in. Let me tell you something. It's time to get back to your daily uh, present and realize I need to get into the word. I need to get back to prayer. I need to review my promises. I need to understand this is all about the future. This is not about the 21st century. This is not about the coronavirus. This is not about me losing my job. This is about fulfilling the power of a prophecy that's in my future. In Jesus' name. I remember, I remember we were just kids and uh, pardon me for using this illustration, but it just seems to work so, so aptly with this, this message here this morning. I remember that uh, we were playing uh, football in the front yard of my house. We were just kids. And I remember us huddling up and thinking, man, we're, we're big shots like the NFL. And I would tell this guy right here, I'd say, okay, now listen, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take three steps, do a button hook, turn around, do a spin, do a fake, go five steps, the ball's gonna be there. I wasn't really that good, but I, I, I thought I was cool. And the other guy would say, you just, you just go for the long bomb. And the other guy would you know, block this guy, turn around, do a button hook, fake him out, the ball's gonna be there. And you know what, we, do, we just enjoyed that. But that's a little like what it takes to receive your promise in the future. It might just be, you know what, I'm gonna go on this three-day fast. I'm gonna go ahead and go on another level of praying. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna prepare myself. I wanna tell you, that ball is in the air. That ball is in the air. That prophecy is in the air. That promise is in the air. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman. I'm gonna fake the devil out here. I'm gonna go on a five-day fast. I'm gonna start witnessing like I've never witnessed. And when that promise, when those divine indicators with every fulfillment, 
there are divine indicators. I'm going to be looking in God's direction and I'm going to catch that ball. I'm going to get my prophecy. I don't know what Timothy's prophecy was. It might have been that Ephesus was going to be one of the preeminent apostolic churches. We do know that it was one of the preeminent apostolic churches because in Acts chapter number 16, the apostle Paul forbade, the the Holy Ghost forbade Paul to go into Asia Minor and go to Ephesus. He rerouted Paul to Macedonia. I don't know who that Macedonian was that said, come over and help us. It might have been in a Philippian jail. It might have been somewhere, uh, somewhere in there in their journey that was localized. I do not know. But I do know that Ephesus played a key role in having great revival in the rest of Asia Minor because the six churches that are mentioned in addition to Ephesus in Revelations chapter two and three were never even visited. They were never, I believe that Ephesus was the spiritual, it was the spiritual giant that had to come down before we could get into Laodicea, before we could get into Philadelphia, before we could get into Sardis, before we could get into Thyatira. I believe that, I don't know what that prophecy was that included Timothy, but I do know that it required some type of discipline for him that I can't get involved in what everybody's saying over here and I can't get involved with all the nonsense over here. I've got to fight for my future. I've got to fight for this prophecy because it's going to be big and it's going to be glorious and I'm going to be a part of it. Let's lift our hands. Let's clap our hands. Let's give God God all the praise. God's not done with you. God is not through with you. God has not pushed you to the side. If you're watching this here today, I want you to take heart that God has another door. If you wore out the shelf life of your existing promise, God has another door for you. Let's lift our hands and praise him right now by the authority of the name of Jesus. God, I love you. God, I praise you. God, I worship you. God, I give myself to you. God, I give you everything. I want to be a part of what you're doing, regardless what's going on in our culture, regardless what's going on with the government, regardless, 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 I'm going to fight for my future. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you. Still controls me